to let you know that this is the belonging serial belonging series set up by Imperial as one um, and it's to have a candid conversation about them exploring the BAME experience. Now I don't know about you but this week it's been quite an emotional week um, and before I introduce our uh, our speaker or our, in, our um, invited speaker for today which is Chris Jackson um, I just wanted us to reflect a little bit about some of the events which have happened this week and to pay tribute to some of the things which have happened. So, as I said, it's going to be a conversation with Chris Jackson, but I think you'd have had to be living on a different planet if you haven't heard about the events with um, George Floyd this week. And as Imperial as one, what we did was we wrote this little piece, which I'd just like to read out for you, just to say that we are, we are hearing and we know what the experience is. Racism is real in America, in the UK and around the world. I can't breathe. To be witness to the televised murder of another person because of the color of his, seat, of his skin. To see the video spread out across the internet is heartbreakingly sad. It's terrifying, brutal, and dehumanizing. This is not a film. This is one of life's inequitable realities. For years, people of color have spoken out against systematic racism that we live and breathe daily. We're told so often that you're making it up. We're playing the race card. Racism is not a game, it's real pervasive and takes away people's lives. It's everyone's responsibility to examine their practice, check their behavior, and learn that there's more that unites us than divides. No, it's not a chip on our shoulder. It's your knee on our neck. I can't breathe. We're just gonna go into a minute silence and then we'll begin our conversation. Thanks everyone for, for observing that minute silence so immaculately. Chris, I know it's a bit of a, could you just switch your mic on for me please? All right. Hi everybody. All right. I know it's been a bit of a, um, a strange kind of week for everyone, um, but we want to just welcome you and say thank you so much for agreeing to, to be with us today. Um, as I said, it's a bit strange because normally it's we want to find out a, a lot about your own background, but I think that's going to be tempered with the events which have happened. But I do really want to focus on some of the experiences which you have had and how you've got to the lofty heights of Professor, right? As a as a black man, and as we can see, right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put it there on on it. Um, despite everything, you've made it, right? You've made it to to a, a significant level, and we want to just explore that journey with you, okay? And if you could take us through some of the highs, some of the lows, some of the challenges which you've faced, and how you've overcome them, okay? So 
I'm going to let you yeah. start your story because it is your story. It's your experiences. So I'm going to let you kick off and I'll just interject when and where is necessary. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for the invitation to take part in, um, in, in this series. And like, you, you know, like Wayne said, it's a, it's an odd time, isn't it? Because it, this kind of significance of what's happened and how broadly it's affected so many people kind of makes talking about academia and some of the things I've done when we are collectively trying to do in academia quite kind of makes them seem quite small because it reminds you for everything we might want to concern ourselves with the struggle to make it to professor in Pilgrim college they are nothing compared to the struggle of actually not being murdered for the color of your skin so you know like if we want to build any great successes and we want to achieve greater things and for me this is a really important thing about how we measure success we need to think about some need to have for them to pursue a life without fear <laughs> let alone a life with money and opportunity there's, there's much more basic sort of human rights level and things we need to, to tackle um, you know so with that said you know when I kind of think about you know the journey I've been on um, it goes obviously all the way back to like where I grew up and, and my, my parents and and I don't know if that's an appropriate place to start yeah. but for me it is because that's very much informed sort of who I am today and how I conduct myself so my, my parents were both from the Caribbean. My mum was from Jamaica, my dad was from St. Vincent, and they arrived in the UK around about 1966, 1967. So towards the end of the Windrush kind of yeah. era. Um, you know, they were, and, and it, again, it's this odd thing, you know, they were sort of invited over. It was still part of the time when the UK was kind of reaping the benefits of its colonial past and drawing on the Commonwealth country. Con country so you know in an odd way if you think about that the opportunity that was afforded to my parents then to come over and and build some sort of life for themselves as in their case nurses mm -hmm. in some obscure town in the east midlands came out of a, a quite a torrid and difficult history which is being sort of illuminated now you know the kind of colonial past of the uk mm. um, so they came over here bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and um you know, just kind of got on with it. And it's very odd when I talk to my parents about their experiences when they came in the late 60s, early 70s, they, they often talk in very glowing terms about the opportunities they were given. They very rarely talk in any negative way about any of the racial prejudices they experienced then. Mm -hmm. But I know they did, because when I've said, was there racism and were you discriminated against? They just go, oh, of course, yeah, of course, yeah. Of course we were. And, yeah. and for them, it's kind of an odd thing because they're just like, yeah, like everybody was racist. And, you know, we weren't allowed in certain pubs. And, you know, people used to use discriminatory remarks all the time. And so for them, it was so like baked into their existence. Um, and they were so captivated by all the opportunities the UK gave them when they arrived. That probably says quite a lot about what they were willing to suffer. Yeah. And, and not recognised because they, they felt like their opportunities away from their homelands was, was, so, was so, so great, it was worth putting up with that, 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 those problems. Um, so yeah, so they, they moved over and worked as, as nurses in, in Derbyshire, which is where I'm from. Um, me and my brother were born and then just growing up, we had a fairly standard sort of upbringing, working class, um, not huge amounts of money, mm -hmm. um, but very, very. Um, oh, thank you. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, I'm actually at a friend's house because our house is being sort of photographed for a letting. So I'm across at my. <laughs> it's all right, man. <laughs> thank you, Lorna. So Lorna's just coming with a cup of tea for me. Sorry. Um, so. Um, you know, it was kind of odd. You know, very friendly environment. Very, very white area, Derby, where I grew yeah. up. Very white. Um, and you know, uh, often when I talk to people about my, my history, I want to point at all these terrible things that happened that hardened me. But people there were genuinely just quite nice. Yeah. The school was quite nice. The people at school quite in my year, there were five black pupils. So did I feel isolated? Did I feel like I didn't belong? No, not really, because I 
think it's a combination. Fortuitously, that was a quite positive environment. My mm. parents, they experienced what they'd gone through in the 60s and 70s. It obviously just kind of, kind of like conveyed to me the importance of, you know, the very Caribbean trait of just working hard and respecting your elders. Yes. And they gave me that. And I, and, and I was kind of, you know, I was and still remain, I think, quite a strong world person. So any negativity that came my way, I would just be like, well, look, this seems like it's your problem. You know, I'm doing my work, I'm doing my sports, I'm doing well in these things. Like, this just sounds like a problem for you. My parents would be very, very keen for us to kind of identify with who we were and our strengths and weaknesses. And then other people just needed to get over their problems, really. Mm -hmm. um, See, so, yeah, I grew up, in, I grew up in, in that school and kind of went through. My brother became a postman. He still is a postman. I was a kind of odd one because I'm first generation university attendee from, you in, know, in, in, in the Jackson sort of line or the Morse side as well, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the kind of the, the, the genesis of like before I went to university. I don't know if you want to ask me anything about my upbringing. Because yeah, it sounds to me from what you've said, that the the traits of working hard the recognition of working hard and um, you've also mentioned about being strong-willed and actually seeing anything which you encountered which may have been negative you didn't see it as as your problem you you saw it more as somebody else's problem and um, where did you get that that kind of like self-belief from would it would you say it was from your parents yeah, I think so. I think, I don't know, it's hard, isn't it? Nature versus nurture. I don't know how much of it is kind of genetic and how much of it is like your environment gives you a series of skills and, and, and opinions and worldviews and, and you use those. Um, I honestly don't know, Wayne. It's a good question. Um, if I, you know, so, okay, one thing I can do is I can compare myself to my brother. Okay, so he's four years older than me and he is like, a very, very different personality to me. He's much more introverted. He's always been, you know, much more uncertain of himself. And he's, and, and yet he had the same upbringing as I did and the same parental input. Well, more or less. It's, you know, parents still do change their behavior to, yeah. to their to siblings. To match the child. Yeah, that's right. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we, we are quite different, but they kind of said the same things to him, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, whatever it is, I'm very pleased that is part of my personality. And that's not to say that I don't get upset, you know, <laughs> most topically by recent events. I'm not turning around to all the people graffitiing over Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. and all the white people who are using this as an opportunity to talk about black privilege. Mm -hmm. I'm not... That, that hurts me, right? And that yeah. will hurt everyone because it, it allows you to a point, doesn't it, to bat away that sort of criticism and all yeah. of the smaller microaggressions that happen as you're moving around your daily business. But after a while, it just accumulates. And, and um, maybe my power, maybe my thing has been I can put up with more of those smaller shitty things. And then when it comes to like the major things, all of those minor things all come back at you and you yeah. kind of remember all the times things have happened yeah so that's 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 fantastic i understand that the differences between siblings and stuff like that and your parental input but what about then what gave you this drive to to you said that you were the first generate first person first generation to go to university where was that drive from where did that come from what, what was that about so there was no, I mean, so from, from the home point of view, mm -hmm. there was absolutely no pressure from my parents. So my parents, and it'd be interesting to hear what other people on the call think, um, but my parents were very much, we want you to work hard and we want you to try hard and, if, and that's all we want. They were not like, you need to go to university, you need to academically succeed. They were like, you need to eat your food, you need to say please and thank you. When a piece of work is there, you need to apply yourself <laughs> and then walk away and say you've done everything you can. And that was, and for me, and again, based on my personality, I think that was useful for me because I think if I ended up in a conflict situation where they had a vision of, an aspirational vision of what they wanted 
to me to become and they were kind of my access to sport and cutting that might have been net damaging for me you know that might have been really problematic for me so fortuitously i think they handled me as a child in the right way in that way the other bit of it is the school so away from home the school was very not an academic school it didn't have a long history of sending people to universities so again, the guidance we got there was very kind of just generally encouraging about working quite hard. Um, I never really got, Chris, you're already clever, you need to go and do A-levels. Chris, you're already clever, you should have this expectation around your GCSEs. Um, so, so one thing I always tell, tell people a story about is, um, I wasn't gonna go to university um, because I'd never heard of it until the second year of my A-levels, and I went to a tertiary college because my mm. A-level college at my school, the sixth form block, burnt down. Oh, no. So it, somebody set fire to it. So, uh, so we all had to go to what was called a tertiary college, so like a city college. So I went to this tertiary college, mm -hmm. and, um, and somebody said, oh, you know, the open day, they were like, oh, you know, you should go and think about going to university and go and do A-levels, and I went and did A-levels, and then somebody said, you might want to think about university. And then mm -hmm. I started just talking to people, what's university about? Said, well, you go and study and, you know, you can sort of like hang out and go to clubs, party. And I was like, this sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> 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 I'm really hearing about this now. And then somebody's like, you know, you have to study a bit and like find out stuff about stuff. And I was like, okay. So I actually, it was, it was actually in the, in the, it was just before the UCAS sort of submission deadline I found out about it. So then I applied to do geology because geology was the thing when I looked in the UCAS book, I was like, oh, I know about geology. I sort of enjoyed doing that for my um, um, GCSE and my A-levels. Yeah. Um, so that all kind of just sprung up from that. So there was no long historical push towards university from school mm -hmm. or from my parents. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of something I carry with me now in a positive way I think is I sort of don't feel like an academic I'm not a career academic I don't come from a long academic lineage mm -hmm. I kind of like stumbled into academia and mm -hmm. I'm thankful for it because mm -hmm. of the, the, some of the things it's brought me and the opportunities um, but I do feel a bit like not an imposter but you in some ways because there's some people working so hard to make it in academia and get into academia and I kind of feel I've not had that like long historical desire to get in and I maybe am taking up a space for somebody whose entire identity is based around them being an academic right <laughs> and my identity is being some black kid from Derby who liked playing sport a lot loves watching football on telly you know, like, like saying that with his friends, like that's my identity, yeah. that black person. And then I just do academia to get some money and because right. it's kind of good fun. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I like your motivation, I really do. Um, one of the questions, you said that you played sports. I'm just, just digressing a little bit, right? Because yeah. you said that you, you, you love sports, you, I believe, really quite good at sports. How come it ended up you going university and not the sports route? Were you ever pushed <laughs> towards sports or, or how did that work out? Just, I'm just looking yeah, at your yeah. motivations. No, 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 it's a good question. So I, um, I did county level athletics. So I actually took part in the national athletics championships for schools. And I played football up to kind of county standard as well. So I was playing like to a good level of um, football and also athletics. Um, mm -hmm. And I was working, you know, and I was doing like three training sessions for football a week and then three matches, Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning. And then when it was athletic season, I was doing two training sessions a week plus competitions. Yeah. And my poor parents or my parents' friends were driving us around everywhere. That was all great and it kept me busy and it took my mind away from academic work, you know, to... The physicality of sport is something I still really cherish. I run a lot and cycle a lot now, and I need that physicality. Yeah. Um, but it got to a point where it was just very hard, where there were some decisions about, okay, if you're going to go to um, um, kind of um, one of the FA schools of excellence for football, you'd have to commit to doing a lot more training, and, and you'd have to leave 
um, doing the athletics and your academic work would have to be dropped slightly and you'd have to be doing academic work at the center of excellence and things like that. And it got to that point, I think, where there was, you know, and again, it comes down to black representation, of course, because in the 90s, the 80s and 90s, you know, there were increasing numbers of black footballers. So the few black role models that were out there for a black kid in my situation were in football and largely yeah. in the NBA, right? In basketball, yeah. more so. Yeah. But more black footballers. But then I was like, well, what's the chances of becoming a professional footballer? And, you know, this was probably one of the very few conversations I had with my parents where they were like, well, it's pretty hard. And are you willing to sacrifice all these other things? And what's the likelihood of you becoming a professional footballer? And I was like, well... You know, I don't know. I just think it's probably worth doubling down on not going there and actually carrying on just studying. Mm -hmm. um, what they should have said is, what's the chance of you becoming an uh, academic geologist? <laughs> it's probably equally as unlikely. <laughs> maybe ignorance was bliss in that case. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe. Maybe so. Yeah, so that was, that was the story of that way. And it's, I, I really needed it. But it came to a point where I just thought I couldn't juggle all those balls and, 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 and be successful in them all. So I decided to, in that case, I decided to kind of drop a load of things as I came into the second year of my, um, second year of my A-levels. Right, okay. And so you've now focused, you're going into, um, you, you selected um, geology, okay? Yeah. And you, I believe you went to Manchester University to do geology, did, yeah? yeah? Um, why geology? What was Why it about? Ge yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so again, I, I've kind of talked to people about this before. People go, oh, as a geologist, you're from Derbyshire. You must have spent a lot of time out in the hills. And we did. Like, my parents were these weird black caravanners and campers. So I had these, like, very awesome memories of putting up a tent in the rain in the middle of the Peak District with my parents as the only black family there. And I was like, what are these people doing? Like, why would you do this? And my parents were like, oh, you know, we got my dad was always finding stuff and i think he found a tent so that was literally how we ended up going camping and caravan and growing up so i did spend quite a bit of time in the outdoors growing up and i think because of the sports i did cherish the outdoors just being outdoors but not necessarily that i was collecting stones and looking right. at landscape i, I yeah. wouldn't say that was why i became a geologist mm -hmm. I think maybe bits of that did soak into me. And then one of the, and, and, and again, one of the things I found really most straightforward when I was studying was geology. Right. I, I did well in maths and science and all my studies at GCSE. But the thing I found probably most engaged with was geography yeah. and the physical side of geography. Mm -hmm. and, and because of that, maybe I'm a lazy person at heart. I really like to do things I find straightforward and things which are fueled by a genuine interest, that hump of having to make something important to do it has probably never been really in my spirit. You know, right. I quite like to couple an interest with a natural desire and that's why I ended up doing geology because I found it most straightforward and then I found it interesting and, mm -hmm. and I, it kind of really spoke to my desire to be outside and not just locked inside all the time. Yeah, yeah I, I, I totally understand that. Trust me, yeah. I understand that. So you, you then did your degree and now um, when, when, was, when was that transition? What, what was it that got you from having done your geology degree to then making the next career step? Either you could have gone into work or you could have taken the academic route. What was that decision-making process? Or did it just fall into your lap? What was it? It comes straight off the last dance. Just a minute there. I really, really enjoyed my geology undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. And somebody came to me, my... We've got a bit of sinking issues here. Enjoying these studies, you like to do a PhD, you get to go to Egypt and spend a lot of time in the desert mapping rocks and looking at rocks and doing this sort of thing. And I said yes, and, and again, it was an easy decision for me because I just love the subject so much. Mm -hmm. What I didn't do, which is not particularly strategic, is think about what I was going to do afterwards. Right. And, 
And for people on the call who are thinking about you know, higher education or postgraduate studies, you know, that's probably something people are talking more readily about now is like, what would you do if you did a master's afterwards? Because financially, there's a big commitment there. And likewise with a PhD. Um, and I didn't really think too strategically about that. I didn't do a PhD with the aim of becoming an academic. And in fact, when I finished my PhD, I then went into, um, into uh, a job. So I went into work in the, in the energy industry. Right. Um, so the decision-making process was just this continuity of, of doing something I enjoyed without much strategic thought about what would come after it. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. So, so then how did you get into academia then? You went and got a job. What, what, what drew you back? Um, a few different things. I worked, so I worked in Norway, in, in Bergen, in Western Norway, for about two and a half to three years for an energy company then called Norsk Hydro, now called uh, Equinor. Yeah. Um, and I was enjoying bits of that, applying academic knowledge in a research centre to apply problems, so looking for oil and gas primarily, um, lots of freedom, lots of kind of researchy stuff going on. Um, I guess there was a slight personal issue there that, that my, my now wife, who was out there with me in Bergen, she um, couldn't get a job out in Norway, so she came back to the UK. Right. So there was that thing. So we were sort of separated at that point. Um, there was also a growing sense in me that the energy industry was a bit constrained in terms of how they did things and what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. it was amazing in many, many ways. But one thing I found really difficult was, okay, here's a project. You've got two weeks, do some work in that two weeks, which is going to be really scrappy and quite quickly done, deliver it to people who are then going to maybe misuse it. And then your name's still going to be on it and then move on to the next thing. And I found that that dynamism a bit unsettling. Right. And maybe that, maybe that was the kind of sign that there was a bit of an academic in me that I wanted to spend more, more time. time working the problem and have more responsibility and more, um, more kind of ownership on some of those scientific things I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I ended up then, you know, then those two things sort of combined to me thinking, okay, I want to go back to the UK. How can I do that? I love geology. I still want to stay in it. I still like, you know, the freedom of research. Mm -hmm. So I actually came back to initially to try and do a postdoc, which fell through. But right, okay. I, 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 that was the reason, yeah. Mm. So how did you end up then at Imperial? Yeah, so, so uh, I ended up at Imperial. I applied for a postdoc with uh, Gary Hamson and Matt Jackson, who are now two of my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, that fell through because of the funding, but there was a maternity cover available for a year. Right. So one of my colleagues was going on maternity leave. They needed someone to cover for a year. So I said, I'll come back for a year. I'll do this maternity cover. I spent about the first two or three months, like, you know, getting involved you know with the teaching they wanted me to do and stuff like this mm -hmm. and all the time i was still looking for postdocs and other institutions because i was like well this year will go pretty quickly i need to apply yeah. so i applied for a few of the places a few things came up but then after about six months in imperial imperial turned around and said oh we really liked how you've settled in the department and you've worked hard we'd like to um maybe offer you a an extension mm -hmm. for a year and i thought okay that's pretty good but I might want to go and do a postdoc for two or three years. So I carried mm -hmm. on applying mm -hmm. and um, eventually they said, oh, no, actually, you know, we'd like to offer you a permanent position. Okay. So my position at Imperial College came out of a one year maternity position opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've been there now 16 to 17 years. <laughs> <laughs> Once they get into you, man, they can, you can't get out. <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> But, it, but it, speaks to, it speaks to kind of a different era. And this is one reason I'm very, very passionate about EDI in general, not just as pertains to blacks, but just in general, is this idea that we can somehow measure people in all these different ways to make sure that they're excellent and brilliant and they can get a seat at the table. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, they'll fail in the system. And I guess I look very much at my own story and I realise I had like no research income, no PhD students one paper when I got the job at Imperial College, okay? And that was in a different era 
Yeah. But I still maintain that maybe the way we're trying to measure people and therefore ultimately penalize some racial and ethnic minorities yeah. is, is, just, is, is just inappropriate. Yeah. And we then don't hold ourselves to account after the fact by saying, has this person done what we wanted them to do? And therefore mm -hmm. our criteria are appropriate. So I think my experience in Imperial through those, those kind of 16 years has been one of the, that's one of the things that's really kind of crystallized in my head is, is how we select people and why and what, what the impact is of that. So if, if, I'm, if I'm getting you right, you're talking about the way in which um, almost like this idea of merit, you earn yes. Excellent. The excellence. And you're, you're almost pushing back against that idea of this is the only way that you can measure excellence. Yes. Because, because if you're going to, if you're going to apply a meritocratic framework like that at certain gates, you've got to assume that everybody who's coming up to that gate has had equal access to the opportunity to, uh, to strive and, and get through that gate and yeah. meet some make some kind of metrics in that meritocratic framework and that's clearly not true and right. and and it's clear not true for, for many reasons not, and the easiest way to work out that it's not true is simply to look at academia now right yeah, <laughs> so like, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. tells you everything to know and and so i think yeah you know kind of that experience of going through imperial the way i got into imperial has been has been useful for me to reflect back and say you know, actually, you can do a lot of things if you're given opportunities, or at least I, you know, that's not to say I've done everything I could and I've conducted right. myself perfectly, mm -hmm. but I'd like to think that having been given the opportunity, I've tried to maximize it, maximize it, and do what's been asked of me and try and get other people in, you know. Yeah. yeah. Could I, one question, one quick question then, because I'm, I, I do want to open it up to others as well, but one quick question is just with regards to. You, you spoke about, I read an article which you wrote a few weeks back, which was about how you got your promotion. And, oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and I thought it was fantastic. Can you just give some of those who haven't yet read that, and we'll put some links in for you later. Um, can you just give some idea as to what you felt helped you to get that promotion? Okay, or, or what, what support mechanisms were there to, to enable you to get from where you were to where you are now? Yeah, I would say number one is, is the family. I think, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of the quote unquote that I've managed to make or things I've managed to do wouldn't have happened without the support of my wife and, you know, my kids as well. Mm -hmm. um, Cause they need to suffice things to allow you to go and do things. Yeah. And then more broadly than that, my parents have been generally supportive, although they still don't know what rocks are. They <laughs> know that I like them. <laughs> and they want me to do well at rocks. You know, my mum does, my dad sadly passed away, but before he passed away, he was just like, hey, just, just do this thing quite well. Um, so that support is really important. And that support is not technical specialist mentoring, just generally go and do this and we're going to try and give you the best to make this happen. Um, oops, sorry, there's a bit of noise in the Somebody who hasn't muted their mic. Could, um, I just asked that everyone mutes their mic. There I might borrow your, um, your trolley. And I now, I now have the key to... Right, sorry, I've, I've, I've caught them. Okay, okay, no problem. Um, and then the, the second bit is more of the kind of, you know, job related mentoring then is people believing in you and people partly guiding you through the kind of, what do you say, the academic journey and through the mm -hmm. jungle, you know, like telling you where to go and what to do and what, or what to do. It's, it's, it's partly that, you know, the, the pulleys and the levers of academia, people mm -hmm. telling you where they are and how they work. But it's also just generally encouraging you and saying you know you've got this or like if you've got a problem come and see me mm -hmm. um all of my mentors and this is going to come as no surprise to anybody we're all who work in geosciences all of them were white men pretty much right yeah yeah and they were all awesome people they were all you know, I never, I never got the sense from them that they saw me as a black charity case or that they were mm -hmm. doing anything that was, you know, in any way sort of saying, you can be this good, but don't 
rather being that good. You can be a little bit less good and because you're black, you, you know, this is, you know, Chris, go for this and mm -hmm. then we'll kind of build a case around the rest of it. Or we'll build the rest of the case around your blackness. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not the case. They were just like, you should be doing this and this really well and this is how we can try and help you do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's really an important message is that mentorship, but that mentorship can come in, in many forms, you know. Um, it can come from people who do look like you and people who don't look like you. And I think it requires a degree of proactiveness on the parts of those mentors who don't look like the people, their mentees, is to go and seek them out and say, look, you're, 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 you're striving academia, we want to try and get you in to do this. Um, so yeah, I think I think that I think they're the, the the two things, and then obviously friends in there, you know, confidants, people yeah. who aren't providing you with mentorship. They're just there for you when things are difficult in the same way that your family are, and, you, and and there's a bit more of a shared language beyond your family, right? Because your family are great to a point, but when you're talking about very nerdy, technical, academic -y things, mm -hmm. it's sometimes valuable to have honest and open conversations with people in 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 kind of safe spaces about um you know what you what you're trying to do to make things happen Brilliant. so yeah that's that's my sort of advice around the the blog post i guess that's brilliant no that's excellent because um you mentioned i, I love the way you mentioned these things starting with the family the nucleus and then going broader into the mentorship and also then the value that colleagues can give in helping you to formulate your ideas and, and everything like that. And I think yeah. I'm going to open up to questions, right? And then I'm going to come back with my final question. So guys, we could be here for, I know we could be here for a lot longer, but I'm going to ask if there's anyone with a burning question for Chris, if they just want to um, put any of those forward. Otherwise, I'll continue talking, trust me. If you want to raise your hands, um, or I can. But don't be shy. All right. There's a lot of people. Don't worry about anybody else's. Right. There was, there was a couple of points which were, um, I'm just having a quick. So look. wait, yeah, I've got some hands right. Oh, okay. thanks, <laughs> William. Go ahead. Yeah, I think you got myself and Medina. Yeah, let me ask my. Um, so, um, thank you, Professor Jackson. Really interesting. So my question is about listening to your journey. So the whole idea of um, like when people talk about oh, getting into academia and that black people need role models, but actually your journey is quite unique. <laughs> So people couldn't follow what you do. So, when, so that's why like when people ask me, you know, well, you're a role model because you're an academic. But I say, but the way I got into academia, you can follow me <laughs> and do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. That, that. So in a way, I suppose, what are, are there more structural things, do you think, that can open up the space yeah. for diverse people? And what do you think about this whole idea of, Role models. Yeah, this is this is very true. So it's like, well, how do we make another Chris Jackson? Like, we need to duplicate his parents, and then we need to take all of these unique circumstances, experiences to make like here. It's pointless, of course it is, right? Because you can't you can't replicate those things. So the term you used there was what are the structural train changes that could be made to allow more people like us to succeed, right? Um, and yeah, so, so yes, what am I thinking? I still think a lot of the power and a lot of the influence and a lot of the changes are going to come about not by the actions of the minorities, or in this case, say the black minorities, they're going to come about by the actions and the will of the majority, right? They're going to, they're going to need to have those big structural changes being made at institutional level. And actually, you know, I think I made this point at an event I went to last year where I created with this idea that first have no power agency, right? It makes it sound like it, power is something that somebody has to give to you. And what people should be doing is relinquishing that power and 
and and telling other people you know you you can you can influence your own path and i'm going to step aside and allow you to do that um and the other thing is um and you use the word structure. Another thing at this event I got very upset about is this idea that the structure is as it is. We can't do anything about it. You have to navigate this structure. That's mm. just not appropriate, you know? People don't have the energy and the time when they're busy trying to get food and looking after their family members or dealing with racism on a day-to-day -day basis to be pissing about navigating this system. It's not fair to do that. And in fact, also, if anybody does make it through that system, they are going to be far stronger than some of the people who haven't had to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've done that and they've done it. And in fact, those people should be leading the world, <laughs> leading academia, right? Because if they manage to do that. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, to go back to your question, William, as you kind of phrased it, I guess that's my thoughts is it's very hard to individualize the solutions and it has to be done at a far higher strategic level and it has to be done with the aim of just removing all of the things which has led to, which have led to academia looking like it does today. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer. Um, Medina, I think you also have a question which you wanted to ask Chris. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, thanks, Chris, for the and Wayne for the conversation. It's been really insightful. Um, my original question was going to be about your transition from kind of more industry to academia, but I think I want to change my question slightly. That's fine. Um, and maybe if you could discuss, do you think there's any aspects of the academic kind of system or environment that are unique to the system which you know, have particular challenges with regards to diversity, you know, things which are more specific to academia than, say, industry or other sectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think, it's a great question, Medina. I think it is the value of the individual over the, the kind of, the value of the team. So I think if, okay, so take an example, like we, 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 we get promoted because of our individual, largely our individual achievements. We get prizes oftentimes because of our individual achievements. We don't do a particularly good job of measuring, partly because it's hard to measure, but I would argue measuring anything is difficult, even papers, outputs. Mm -hmm. We're not very good at measuring the impact of, people on people's lives or on people who are working in their teams and therefore the opportunities you have given other people by your actions mm. so i think my experience in industry would suggest industry is better at doing that right there's a, there's a collective there's a collective strength brought by you know the actions of many individuals in the form of a team which allows a you know, a, a team within an, an organization or the organization as a whole to, you know, make more in, get more revenue or to, you know, broaden its reach or whatever its influence, whatever it might be, however, whatever it's trying to achieve. And I think academia has a kind of, a kind of really weird <laughs> schism about that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. We sort of need everybody to, we need to work as a team for academia to work, but we then end up measuring people individually about things. So yeah, uh, hopefully that answers your question I think there is that difference and I think it's the, the main difference is that we measure people as individuals let me just let me just follow up on that point so you're saying it would be more <coughs> beneficial to measure people or well not measure people measure the output by the team as opposed to be so individualized in the, the measurement procedure I'm not I'm not saying I, I, I don't know if I mean I'd I'd, t I'd totally rip up and start again with the individual metrics because I think right. a load of them are, are, just, are just nonsense. Yeah, absolutely. I think, we, I think we need to change that. I don't think we should get rid of it. Mm -hmm. I think what we should be doing is measuring other things that are important in academia. And I think by doing this, one, one, one um, benefit of measuring things like, let's say, um, teamwork or, or or kind of um, things that build socially you know socially significant bonds between people that allow other great things to happen 
and admissions and all the kind of less glamorous things that happen in academia, a lot of those tasks are being carried by people who are in minority groups. And I'm not just mm -hmm. talking about race and ethnicity here. Mm -hmm. They're being carried by those groups. So if you start to include those things, that's kind of interesting way, isn't it, of then valuing those minorities groups' contributions to academia. Because academia sort of does a very good job of saying, well, these papers are really important in this big flashy project. But actually all this stuff with the engagement and admissions and all these things are less glamorous. Mm -hmm. um, therefore, we're not going to reward or, or recognize mm -hmm. them as that's increasingly happening, I admit. People are looking at rewarding, recognizing and rewarding in those spaces. But I do like this idea of coupling, you know, the, the, the team-based recognition system with an EDI strategy. Mm -hmm. And that's not the flag, that's not to say, okay, we're gonna have a prize for the best black professional services member of staff, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's just <laughs> But you could you could actually have prizes which look more in those spaces, and then I think it would then value and reward the people in those minority groups. Brilliant, Chris. I know we could carry on talking for for ages, right? But I'm just wary of the time, and that people may have to go. So I'm going to just see: is there any one last burning question from anyone? If not, I have just one last point to make. Um, I'll just go for a very quick question. Thanks, Chris, for a great talk. It's fascinating. It's really interesting to hear about the fact that you hadn't heard of university. And it really kind of opened my eyes to think how we can um, get our leaders to open their eyes to see, because I know they're very scared about changing the path of A-levels, university, like people need to be really on a path to make it all the way to the excellent institute. That yeah. really is. Um, I want to say, how do you think we can use this moment, this Black Lives Matters movement, where we seem to be uh, increasing the number of allies that we have at the moment? How can we use this moment to get them to take on more of the work that you said often falls onto the minority groups? Good question. Yeah, very good question. My answer is, and I've been pretty involved in this over the last few days, is start asking really, really, really hard and hard to answer questions now get on the phone, get on the emails, get on the social media, start asking for change. If, you know, like, you know, this, you know it's, it's, it's no secret, you know, there was discussions about Imperial College's motto yesterday, the context of colonialism, and it's super icky, right? And, and if they're not going to change it now, um, when would they? Mm -hmm. And yet that signal it could send by saying, you know, we have this colonial past we recognize it we agree it's problematic for these reasons and in the future we're going to change it by doing this i think that's a hugely important sign from an institution isn't it to yeah. own a problem and then put in place a solution what you don't want to do is is ignore it yeah and one is deny it is to double down on denying it and say well it's an old historical thing nobody really matters because it, you never know, do you? They, people could be looking at that, aware of it, and that puts them off entering academia because they think it is this very elitist space that cherishes colonialism, like, because it has it on its like, <coughs> map. Safeguarding but, the empire. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Oh, my goodness, yeah, exactly. It hurts to hear it, right? But exactly, so I think this is my message is push and push hard, push politely but push firmly, you know, we don't have to be, you know, screaming and shouting and swearing, but we need to be saying, this means a lot to us for these reasons and we're really hurt and we want you to change this. And if you don't do it, we're going to keep on coming back. And we're not just going to come back ourselves or looking the same. We're going to come back with allies who look like you, yeah. who are equally as upset by this. And I think that is sending a really good message that these issues are very broad and they're systemic and, and it affects everybody. And it's not just a bunch of black people like Wayne said that start with chips on their shoulders in the one imperial statement that, you know, we're just turning up to try and make our own lot better. We're not. Mm. It's not. That's right. brilliant. And just to add that there may be good news coming out later today with regards oh. to the photo. Oh, that'd be good. <laughs> I think change is coming. Change is definitely yeah. coming. Chris, I'm going to just ask, this is the final question from me. And I just want to say a big thank you for your insightful um, and candid interview that you've given us today. It's been excellent. I'm just looking and I see someone saying, my daughter is watching, right? So my question to you is, what would you say to your younger self, Chris? 
um, about where you are now and what you would, how you would advise them. Someone's saying my son's watching too. <laughs> <laughs> your, your son and your daughter are not me. And this is coming back to this individual story, you know, goodness gracious me, little Chris wouldn't have listened to anybody probably. <laughs> <laughs> only listen to his mum uh and um, what would i say to my younger self um i would honestly probably say to him um be maybe at a younger age be more aware of people's differences i guess by being different i was aware of my own difference against all the white people i grew up with just purely based on the colour of my skin, but not by anything else. I played football with them. I did academically mm -hmm. better than some of them. Mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I felt that difference. And then I got to university and I was, there was more you know, racial and ethnic mix, mixing in that, that, like kind of a different, a more diverse set of people. But again, there was a class division and maybe I wasn't picking up those differences as, as, as quickly as I should have. So I would probably say to that younger Chris, be aware of people's differences and kind of equip yourself with how you conduct yourself when you're with them and how they are conducting themselves when they're with you and so you're better able to talk to them and then I'd probably be in a and I think I've done that maybe over the last like 10 15 years um that wasn't say I was wholly ignorant of it before but I guess I've been very very sort of concerned with these issues you know ever since I got to Imperial and, and in the mm. later stages of being but I think a younger Chris would have benefited from, from realizing, I guess intersectionality is a good word here, mm. right? There, is, there are shared problems between a diverse group of people using that as a kind of lightning rod or a, you know, as, a, as a way of bringing all those people together. We have these shared challenges. How do we collectively talk about solving them? I'd have, I, I kind of wish younger Chris maybe was more involved in that, but I was just busy trying to do some work and not get told off. Yeah, I understand. Fantastic. Chris, I want to just say thank you very much once again. Um, it's been brilliant. Absolutely excellent. Very inspiring. I've learned so much. Um, it's really, really good. So I'm going to just, as I normally do, I'll just advertise what's happening next week. So at this moment, I'm going to just switch over. Um, thank you again, Chris and just let everyone know what will be happening um, next week. So next week we'll be having Jin, sorry, I'm, I've blocked myself out. So next week we'll be having Jin Hao and he is um, a research student but he's looking at risk and um, extended warranty services. But in addition to that, he's an award-winning poet. So tune in next week um, at 12.30 till 1.15 um, to hear Jin Hao. Okay, thank you very much for joining. Um, we're gonna stop the recording and then we can have a little conversation off, off mic. Thanks again, everyone for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming.